Welcome back. We are discussing the lesson reproduction in flowering plants, which can be divided into three stages: pre-fertilization events, fertilization, and post-fertilization events. The pollen grains are transferred from the anther to the stigma with the help of wind, water, insects, animals by the process of pollination. Now, what happens? when the pollen grain lands on the stigma now we know that there are two types of flowers unisexual flowers which contain either the stamens or pistil or bisexual flowers which contain both stamen and pistil in the same flower so in the case of bisexual flowers there is autogamy or self pollination the issue with self pollination is that continued self pollination will result in what is known as inbreeding depression inbreeding depression is nothing but there will be loss of productivity and loss of fertility flowering plants they have developed certain mechanisms to prevent autogamy or self pollination because it is not useful for them these mechanisms by which flowering plants prevent autogamy or self pollination are known as outbreeding devices we can summarize the outbreeding devices under five points point number 1 plants ensure that there is no synchronization between pollen release and stigma receptivity meaning either the pollen grains will mature very early and the ovary will mature later or vice versa due to which either one of them are unavailable for fertilization hence preventing self pollination point number 2 the position of anther and stigma what is this mostly you will find that the stigma is kept at a higher position whereas the anthers lie below the stigma because of which pollen grains of the anther cannot land on the stigma of the same flower thus preventing autogamy genetically the some of the plants have mechanism called as self incompatibility this means if the pollen grain falls on the same flower or falls on the flowers of the same plant then they will be incompatible when the pollen grain lands on the stigma so what will happen one pollen germination will not take place or the pollen tube growth will not take place hence preventing fertilization of the same flower another mechanism is production of unisexual flowers now unisexual flowers they will prevent autogamy but they cannot prevent gynogamy because of which certain sections of the plant family of the flowering plants they have what is called as the dioecious condition meaning the female flower is produced on a separate plant male flower is present on a separate plant therefore preventing both autogamy as well as gynogamy and encouraging xenogamy that is complete cross pollination by these mechanisms flowering plants prevent self pollination and encourage cross pollination next what happens when the pollen grain lands on the stigma that we will discuss under the heading pollen pistil interaction now we know that most of the flowers are are open so it is not surprising that pollen grains of different flowers and different species may land on a stigma of a flower so what mechanism does a flower have 
to recognize the pollen grains of the same type or of the same species. Now, as soon as the pollen grain lands on the stigma of the pistil, the recognition lies within the pistil. So, point number one, the pistil will recognize the pollen grain. This is mainly to do with the structure of the exine and also certain chemical components present in the exine. So there is a chemical crosstalk between the pollen grain and the surface of the stigma due to which the stigma can recognize it. On recognizing, two events can happen. Either the stigma will accept the pollen grain or it will reject the pollen grain. When will the stigma accept the pollen grain? If the pollen grain is of the same type, that is if the pollen grain is compatible, then it will accept it. If the pollen grain is of some other species, then the pollen grain is incompatible. Therefore, the stigma will reject it. All this is because of the chemical crosstalk between the pollen grain and the stigma surface. Now, if the stigma does not accept the pollen grain, it rejects it. In that case, the pollen germination will not take place or pollen tube growth will not be allowed to continue, thus preventing fertilization. In the case of acceptance of a compatible pollen grain, this will result in pollen germination. As you have studied in the previous class, most of the flowering plants, almost 60 to 70 percent, here the pollen grain is shed in the two sided states. There is one large vegetative cell and a generative cell. So, in such plants, the generative cell it will divide and produce the two male gametes. The vegetative cell will then become the tube cell, it will protrude through the generative cell and this tube cell will carry the two male gametes as well as its own nucleus. So that is pollen germination, that is growth of the tube cell and division of the generative cell. In plants, in monocots, where they shed the three sided stage, the vegetative cell will grow to become the tube cell and already the two generative, two nucleus are present, they will all be part of the tube cell. Upon pollen germination, the pollen tube will grow in length. The tube will become more longer. This pollen tube will penetrate the tissues of the stigma and it will also penetrate the tissues of the style and it will go through the style. So, it will move through the stigma and the style and finally the tip of the pollen tube will reach the micropyle of the ovule. The micropyle is a small opening that is present in the ovule. Near the micropylar end you know that there is the egg apparatus which contains three cells. The two synergids and the middle egg cell. In the synergids, we have the specialized thickenings called as filiform apparatus. Now, the pollen tube will enter one of the two synergids with the help of this filiform apparatus. It will guide the pollen tube into one of the synergids. Right from the landing of pollen grain on the stigma till the point pollen tube enters into the ovule they come under pollen pistil interactions. Once 
the pollen tube has entered into the synergid the pollen tube will burst open releasing the two male gametes into the synergids the next step is fertilization flowering plants have what is called as double fertilization which is very unique to them you don't find double fertilization in gymnosperms or the lower plants now once the pollen tube releases the two main nuclei into the synergid one of the main nucleus it fuses with the egg cell this is what is called as syngamy it will result in the formation of a diploid zygote male nucleus is haploid egg cell is haploid together their fusion will result in a diploid zygote the second male nucleus will migrate and will fuse with the two polar nuclei present in the central cell this will result in the formation of a triploid primary endosperm nucleus since there are three nuclei involved in this fusion this is what is called as triple fusion inside the embryo sac there are two fusion events occurring one is the syngamy one is triple fusion because there are two separate fertilization events taking place in the embryo sac this phenomenon is called as double fertilization and with that fertilization stops the next events are studied under the head post fertilization events once fertilization has taken place it starts the post fertilization events in flowering plants some of the important events in post fertilization are the sepals and petals they fall off number 1 number 2 the andrachium that is represented by the stamen it degenerates and withers away most importantly in the embryo sac we see that the zygote will develop into a embryo and the primary endosperm nucleus will form the endosperm tissue followed by the ovule being matured into the seed and the ovary which will then become the fruit these are the major post fertilization events in a flowering plant let us discuss about each of this in detail let us begin with the endosperm formation in most of the flowering plants the formation of endosperm is the first step because for the development of embryo nutrition is required for this endosperm tissue is a must so endosperm development takes place first and embryo formation takes place later now at the end of fertilization the polar nuclei has fused with the second male nuclei and resulted in the formation of primary endosperm nucleus and the central cell is now called as the primary endosperm cell this undergoes repeated mitotic divisions these divisions are free nuclear divisions meaning cell wall formation does not take place initially therefore the endosperm tissue can be of two types it could be free nuclear endosperm or it could be cellular endosperm free nuclear endosperm example coconut water wherein cell wall formation has not taken place and there are many nuclei present in that coconut water the white kernel that you see after some time 
that is an example for cellular endosperm endosperm is a nutritive tissue it is highly nutritious these nutrients are then used by the embryo for the process of embryo genesis embryo genesis is nothing but the development of embryo from the zygote the diploid zygote will undergo a series of mitotic divisions resulting in 4 8 and 16 cells so initially there is a pro embryo stage so in the pro embryo stage we find that there are there is a top layer and there is a lower layer of eight cells each this will later go on to give rise to the embryo in the case of dicot embryo we can see a globular stage which is followed by a heart shaped stage and so on every embryo has three main components there is a embryonal axis and above the embryonal axis we have the epicotyl region which in the future will give rise to the plumule that is the shoot part of the plant below the embryonal axis we have the hypocotyl region which in the future will give rise to the radical that produces the roots depending on whether the plant is a monocot or a dicot embryo can have either a single cotyledon in the case of monocot or there could be two cotyledons in the case of dicot if you look at the structure of a dicot embryo you find that the cotyledons are nothing but leafy fleshy structures which hold a lot of nutrition once the tender young leaves come these cotyledons will fall off the radical is covered by the root cap in the dicotyledon embryo in the case of monocotyledon embryo as you can see in the diagram the radical is covered by the root cap this is covered once again by a undifferentiated sheath called as coleo rhiza similarly the plumule is covered by what is known as the coleoptile and you can find the single cotyledon present to the lateral side of the embryo called as the scutellum once the endosperm development takes place the zygote undergoes embryogenesis and the embryo is formed where is the embryo formation taking place inside the embryo sac where is the embryo sac present inside the ovule or the megasporangium therefore we can say that a fertilized ovule is nothing but a seed seed is the final product of sexual production in flowering plants the seed if you look at the structure of the seed in a dicot seed the seed has a seed coat that is made up of two covering the outer covering is called testa and the inner layer is called as tegmen whereas in a monocot seed the two layers are fused to give you a single seed coat inside the seed coat the embryo development is taking place in the case of dicot seeds you see that mostly the endosperm is completely absent that seeds are called as non albuminous or ex albuminous seeds for example p groundnut this is because during the development of the embryo the endosperm is completely used whereas in most of the monocots 
the endosperm is still persistent even in the seed such seeds are known as albuminous seeds for example wheat maize etc sometimes in seeds of pepper beet the nucellus is also present as a covering the remnant persistent nucellus present in the seed is known as perisperm if you look at the seed under a microscope you will find a small opening a pore that is nothing but the micropyle present in the ovule it is through this micropyle opening that the embryo germinates and comes out not only that the gas is exchanged takes place through the micropyle and water is absorbed by the micropyle it is seen as a small opening in the seed seeds offer various advantages to a angiosperm plant number 1 seeds are well protected by the seed coat which can withstand temperature high water high salt content etc so this are this can withstand unfavorable conditions point number 1 point number 2 seeds have enough nutrients or nutritive tissue present to help in the development of embryo as well as once the embryo germinates therefore the development of embryo is taken care of by the nutritive tissues not only that seeds have developed different types of dispersal mechanisms by which these seeds can be transported by wind water animals etc they can colonize newer habitats where they can grow and create a new population therefore seeds will help in colonizing newer habitats so these are the advantages of seed for a angiospermic plant when the conditions are unfavorable if the content of water or nutrients or temperature humidity etc is not favorable then the seed will decrease its metabolic activities the embryo it will stop its metabolic activities it will come to a stand still and the seed will postpone its germination this is what is called as the dormant period on return of the favorable conditions the seed will immediately undergo germination the embryo will germinate through the micropyle opening in angiosperms seeds are present inside the fruit whereas in gymnosperms seeds are naked talking about the fruit fruit is nothing but fertilized ovary in normal conditions a fruit is developed from a fertilized ovary but there are false fruits and then there are parthenocarpic fruits in the case of a parthenocarpic fruit example banana fruit is developed without the fertilization of the ovary such fruits are called as parthenocarpic fruits false fruits as you can very clearly see in cashew the seed the nut is outside whereas the fruit is on top of that this fruits are developed from parts of the flower other than the ovary normally ovary gives rise to the fruit in false fruits fruits are formed from other parts mostly from the thalamus example apple strawberry cashew etc the wall of the fruit is known as pericarp which offers protection inside the pericarp fruits could be either fleshy for example guava apple or fruits could be dry example groundnut now in the normal sexual reproductive cycle in a in the plants seed is the final product of fertilization it is present inside the fruits in some families of 
angiosperms there occurs a separate alternative process which is called as apomixis apomixis is the phenomenon of production of seeds without fertilization previously we saw that production of fruits without fertilization is parthen karti here the seeds are formed without fertilization how does it happen if you look at the diagram one of the pathways is the megaspore mother cell which is diploid it does not undergo the meiosis and is directly converted into seed this is one mechanism by which a seed can be formed without fertilization another mechanism is the megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis producing the embryo cell when there is the egg cell this egg cell can develop into a seed without any fertilization and sometimes other cells in the embryo cell other than the egg cell can also develop into a seed so we can say that apomixis is a type of asexual reproduction or parthenogenesis other than apomixis there is another phenomenon called as polyembryony in this case what happens is the embryo is developed not from the egg cell not from double fertilization what happens is in citrus plants in mango in euphorbium plants the cells of the mucellus they enter into the embryo sac and this develop into a embryo sometimes even the cells from integument can enter into the embryo sac and develop into embryos so it is called as polyembryo for example if you open the seed of a orange you can see there are many embryos inside that because of this micellar advent that is what is called as polyembryo now plant breeding and cultivation of crops is a very important process for agricultural industry farmers have now used this mechanism of apomixis in order to develop new hybrid varieties now hybrids are those varieties which are superior in productivity as well as in quality the problem with hybrid seeds is that during if these seeds are used for the next generation the hybrid character is lost not only that most of these hybrid plants will be sterile that is they cannot be used for the next season because of this what happens is farmers have to purchase hybrid seeds every planting season from the industries which will increase their cost of production now if these hybrid seeds are converted into apomictic seeds both the problems can be solved because apomixis apomictic seeds they can produce new plants without any problem not only that these apomictic seeds can be used to cross with some other variety and create a new variety also new variety of apomictic generation so it offers advantages to the farmers by decreasing the cost of production and by allowing them to create a new line of apomixis that is about the lesson sexual reproduction in flowering plants